Hello! Welcome to Math 301 Introduction to Common Rhetorics at Colorado State University. I'm Dr. Maria Gillespie and I'm going to be making these videos as part of the Open Educational Resources Project called Counting Rocks and Introduction to Common Rhetorics at CSU. This includes a textbook that's available for free online as well as this series of videos that is linked to from the textbook. This is the first video in the series, and to start off our introduction to combinatorics, we'll start with three classical counting formulas that are going to come up all the time in our combinatorial work. The first one is called the handshake problem, and it's one you encounter in everyday life. Say five people walk into a room, nobody knows each other, and they all shake hands with each other. So every pair of people shake hands. How many handshakes occur? Well, one nice way of modeling this is with what's called a graph where you have nodes and edges between the nodes, and here the nodes, the points here, A, B, C, D, E, represent the five people, and the edges between them represent the handshakes. So we just have to count how many edges are in this graph then to solve the handshake problem. Around the outer border of the pentagon, we have one, two, three, four, five edges, and then the star in the middle also has five edges. So we can see five plus five is 10, and so there are 10 handshakes that occurred in a room of five people. But what about six people, or seven people, or a hundred people? How can we find a formula for how many handshakes occur? Well, let's try to solve the five-person problem one in a bit of a more systematic way first. So we could also solve this by saying, well, person A shakes hands with four different people. You see there's four edges coming out of person A. They shake hands with B, C, D, and E. So that's four handshakes. Then. Person B has already shaken hands with A, because A already shook hands with everybody, and person B then shakes hands with C, D, and E, so there are three handshakes after that. And now C still has to shake hands with D and E, because they already shook hands with A and B. And finally, D shakes hands with E. So total, we have four plus three plus two plus one, which is 10 handshakes. So this is just another way of reframing the problem, a different way of counting them, a different order of counting them. But we get obviously the same answer because there's the same number of handshakes, no matter how we count them. So let's see if we can generalize this now. By the same logic, if there are six people in a room and nobody knows each other and they all want to shake hands, then the first person shakes hands with five other people. The second person has four more people to shake hands with, then three, then two, then one, and so we add up the numbers from one to five and that's 15. So in general, how many handshakes are there for n people? Well, it's going to be the sum of all the numbers from 1 up to n, 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to n. And so we'd like a formula for this sum, and there is a nice formula for this sum that we're going to derive now. So here's a bigger example, just to see what's going on. Let's see, we would say we want to add up all the numbers from 1 up to 10. Well, a slow way to do this would be to start adding 1 plus 2 is 3, and then add 3, and that's 6, and then we add 4, and that's 10, and then 15, and we have to keep going. It's going to take a bit of time, but to do it faster, we can actually add the 1 and the 10 first, and that forms 11. Now add the 2 and the 9, so keep going inwards, that's also 11. One more step gives us 3 and 8, that's also 11, then 4 and 7, also 11. And finally, 5 and 6 is also 11. So we actually have 5 11s, which we can actually just calculate as 11 times 5, which is 55. So this gives us an easier way of adding up the numbers from 1 to 10. But this pairing trick doesn't always work. Say we have an odd number of numbers we're adding up, 1 through 5. Now if we pair up 1 and 5, we get 6. And 2 and 4, we also get 6. But 3 is stuck in the middle by itself. It doesn't pair with anything. So we have like 2 and a half 6s. And that's not as nice of a formula. So we want some formula that unifies the even and odd cases. And the trick is actually just to double the sum. So let's let s denote the sum of the numbers from 1 to n, and then write s backwards, n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2 down to 1. And add this sum to itself. And what's nice is if you add vertically in columns, 1 plus n is n plus 1, 2 plus n minus 1 is n plus 1, 3 plus n minus 2 is n plus 1. Now we're getting all n plus 1s. In fact, we get exactly n of them. But that's twice the sum. So 2s is n n plus 1s. 2s is n times n plus 1, and so all we have to do to solve for s is divide both sides by 2. So s is n times n plus 1 over 2. So this is our first proof we've done in this course, and we're going to be going into rigorous proofs later in the course in chapter 5. But for now, hopefully you can see the logic as to why this formula is the sum of the numbers from 1 to n. This formula is so famous that it has a name, Gauss's Lemma. Gauss, when he was in elementary school, 
His teacher famously gave him uh, busy work because he was bored and done with all his math already. She said, add up all the numbers from 1 to 100. And Gauss looked at it and said, you know what? 1 plus 100 is 101, 2 plus 99 is 101, and so on. And he figured out the answer very quickly, much faster than the teacher expected. And from then on, it became known as Gauss's formula or Gauss's lemma, that the sum of the numbers from 1 up to n is n times n plus 1 divided by 2. Here's an example of where Gauss's formula can come up in other summations. Say we want to add the even numbers from 2 up to 40, 2 plus 4 plus 6 up to 40. One way we can do it is to factor out the 2, because they're all even numbers, and then we get 2 times the sum of the numbers from 1 up to 20, which we can apply Gauss's formula to. So it's 2 times 20 times 21 over 2, by plugging in 20 for n. The 2's then cancel, and so that's just 20 times 21, which is 420. Very fast way of computing the sum of the even numbers from 2 up to 40. So you can calculate other sums using Gauss's lemma as well. Finally, these numbers n times n plus 1 over 2 also have a name themselves. They're called triangular numbers. Because if you draw dots in a triangular grid like this, then there's 1 in the first row, and 2 in the second, and 3 in the third, and so on. So to count how many dots there are in a triangular grid, you add up the numbers from 1 up to a certain point. And so this formula, n times n plus 1 over 2, also is called a triangular number. So we did the handshake problem when we found that it was the sum of the numbers from 1 up to n. But the product of the numbers from 1 up to n also comes up in combinatorics a great deal, especially in the context of what's called rearrangements. So the product of the numbers from 1 up to n has its own symbol. It's called n factorial. There's not some closed formula like there was for the sum. So we just write n exclamation point to just denote that. And so we can just use that as a symbol from now on. For instance, 5 factorial, 5 exclamation point, is the product of the numbers from 1 up to 5, which is 120. So here's the combinatorics question that this corresponds to. How many ways can we rearrange the letters in, say, a three-letter word, cat? So maybe you've played some anagram games before. We're not looking for English words necessarily. This is just any way of rearranging the three letters is valid. So how many ways can we do it? Well, let's draw a little chart here. The first letter can be C, A, or T. And then in the second column, I have all the possibilities for the first two letters. C, A, C, T, A, C, A, T, T, C, or T, A. For each choice of the first letter, there's two ways of choosing the second letter. And then once we've chosen both first two letters, there's only one way of completing the word. So we get all six of these possibilities here. And the way this relates to factorials is that there were three ways of choosing the first letter. For each of those possibilities, two ways to choose the second letter, and for each of those, one way for the third letter. So there's three factorial, or six, ways in all. And this generalizes to any number of letters. For instance, here's a much bigger chart. Feel free to pause the video, zoom in, stare at this for a little bit. How many ways can we rearrange the letters in the word math? Well, now there's four ways to choose the first letter. There's our four. And then for each of those letters, notice there's three different letters we can put after it, right? So we have four times three ways to get to the second column. And then for each of those choices, there's two ways to add the third letter, and then one way to complete the word. So we end up with four factorial, or 24 ways of rearranging the word math. In general, there are n factorial ways to rearrange n things. And this is a very fundamental notion in combinatorics. Here's a bit of a generalization that's going to lead into our third classical counting formula which is, say we want to play the game of anagrams where we can just stop at two letters or three letters. What if we can't want to count how many two-letter words use two distinct letters from math? For instance, M-A or A-M or M-T or T-H or H-A, any two dis distinct letters in a row. Well, now there's four choices for the first letter and three choices for the second, and we just stop there. So there's only 12 ways to make two-letter words. In general, we can say how many k letter words use k distinct letters from n letters, and the calculation is similar. There's n choices for the first letter, n minus 1 for the second letter, n minus 2 for the third, up to, to n minus k plus 1 for the kth letter. If you think about it, this is just the number you have to stop at to make there be k letters here. And so it's the product of these numbers from n down to n minus k plus 1, which is like if you took the whole factorial down to 1 and cut off the numbers from 1 up to n minus k. 
So it's n factorial divided by n minus k factorial by cutting out those other factors. So we have a nice closed formula using the factorial symbol. So finally, we can use that formula to solve our third classical counting problem, which is making choices. And this is really where the term combinatorics comes up, combinations of letters or combinations of things. How many ways can we choose two letters from math in no particular order? Meaning, I just want to pick like the A and the T, but I'm not saying it's the word AT or the word TA. It's just the bucket containing the letters A and T. To do this, you want to first count the two letter words in four times three ways, as we did before, and then say, hang on, A and T, A, T and T, A, we counted that twice. We only want to count it once. We counted everything twice, so we divide our total possibilities by two, and we have only 600 choices. In general, if we want to say how many ways can we choose K things from N things, say K letters from N letters, well, there's an N factorial divided by N minus K factorial words of length K, as we saw before, and each word has k factorial rearrangements, so we overcounted by a factor of k factorial. We counted k factorial times the number of things we wanted to count. So all we have to do is divide by k factorial. We take that formula, divide by k factorial, simplify it a little bit, and we get this famous formula, n factorial divided by k factorial times n minus k factorial. This is so famous that it has its own symbol, just like the factorial, n choose k. You write parentheses, you write the n on top, you write the k on the bottom. You do not put a line between them, it's not a fraction. It's just a symbol, pronounce it as n choose k, and it's sometimes called a binomial coefficient, which we'll see in a later chapter. This binomial coefficient n choose k, it denotes the number of ways of choosing k distinct things from n things in no particular order. And let's keep in mind this formula, n choose k. Let's do one example here to see how it works. How many ways can you choose three team leaders from a team of seven people. So notice once you have a formula for say choosing letters from other letters, you can apply that for you're choosing any things from any other things. It doesn't have to be letters. It can be people, it could be numbers, it can be whatever you're working with. So say you have seven people and you want to choose three of them. Well, we do seven choose three, which plugging into this formula, you write seven where the n is and three where the k is, and you get seven factorial over three factorial times four factorial. If we write out these factorials, before we calculate them. What's nice about factorials is there's a lot of cancellation in these formulas. Um, if we don't actually calculate 7 factorial yet and just leave it unsimplified, then we can start canceling factors in the top and bottom, like cancel the 1s, cancel the 2s, cancel the 3s. This 4 cancels with that 4. And we're left with 5 times 6 times 7 over 1 times 2 times 3. And the denominator is just 6, which cancels with the 6. So we're left with 5 times 7, which is 35. So there are 35 ways of choosing three team leaders from a team of seven people. Pretty nice. So now we have a formula for making choices um, from a given set. So now you try to combine all the formulas that we talked about today by solving this problem, which is say five people walk into a room, but only three handshakes occur. How many possibilities are there for which three pairs of people shook hands? So you try that, and I will see you next time.